All right, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. So uh, my name is Jennifer Croswell. I'm a senior program officer here at PCORI in our research synthesis program. Um, and so we're excited to have you all here today. Uh, we wanted to do this uh, session so that we could tell you a little bit about uh, the systematic review program, which is one of the uh, initiatives that PCORI has been working on within our research synthesis program. So PCORI is legislatively mandated to do evidence synthesis, so we've been working on a number of initiatives for the last two years in this area, so systematic reviews, evidence maps, rapid reviews, other sorts of methods around that, um, individual participant data meta-analyses. And so systematic reviews are one thing that we're doing in partnership with the Agency for H Healthcare Research and Quality. And so we are really happy to, to talk about this particular initiative. We have a number of partners um, from uh, HRQ here, as well as um, some of the individual investigators with the EPC program who do those reviews uh, here to, to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges and ways that we work with stakeholders to do these uh, systematic reviews. So first we're gonna have Dr. Arlene Berman. She's the director for ARC Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement, and that houses, among other initiatives, the Evidence-Based Practice Center program, and that's who uh, PCORI is ha uh, partnering with for the production of our systematic evidence reviews. So she's gonna be providing an overview of the EPC program. She's gonna be highlighting future directions for the program, including reviews of complex interventions, health systems, and the implement implementation of findings from systematic reviews. Next, we're gonna have Dr. Evan Myers. He's the Walter L. Thomas Professor at Duke University School of Medicine, an ad adjunct associate professor of epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's the associate director of the Duke Evidence-Based Practice Center, and that's part of ARC's network of EPCs. So he'll use his time to talk about various methodologic approaches that systematic reviews can take, such as qualitative or quantitative assessments of modeling, and the ways that these findings can be used to, of use to multiple stakeholders. After that, we'll have Valerie, Dr. Valerie Foreman Hoffman. She's the director of the Mental Health Epidemiology and Treatment Services Programs at RTI International, where she works with the RTI UNC Evidence-Based Practice Center. She's going to be discussing a recent joint uh, PCORI ARC systematic review that we did on, uh, it's an update on psychological and pharmacological treatments for adults with PTSD. So she'll be walking us through the process from the idea to the review, uh, conduct to publication, and she'll have an eye towards highlighting key salient issues that the review team grappled with along the way. Then we'll have Nancy O'Reilly. She's the Senior Director for Gynecology and the Women's Preventive Health Services Initiative at the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG. She's gonna be discussing ACOG's experiences using systematic reviews and its recommendations and clinical policy work, as well as the overall process of evidence-based guideline development. So the opportunities and challenges that go along with doing this kind of guidelines work. Finally, we have Jean Slutsky. She's PCORI's Chief Engagement and Dissemination Officer. She's gonna provide a brief synthesis of all of these talks. And she's gonna then moderate a group discussion with all of you on the talks that you heard today. So thank you all very much for being here and thanks to all of our speakers as well. So uh, Dr. Bierman, you first, thank you so much. Good morning. Um, first, I have to apologize. I'm going to have to leave a little bit early because of a conflict, but I'm thrilled to be here today and tell you a little bit about our EPC program. So I know most of you are probably familiar with ARC, but I just wanted to, you know, highlight that ARC's uh, mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, accessible, equitable, and affordable and to work with HHS and other, other partners to make sure that evidence is understood and used. So I'm gonna really um, focus on systematic reviews as part of that evidence ecosystem. Sort of the um, why we do them and you know what, what do we wanna get from them. So we're moving more and more to learning health systems um, where we implement evidence but we also generate um, evidence from practice. Um, so we actually have more of a rapid learning cycle. And systematic reviews are really the keystone of that whole process. Because we start with um, evidence reviews, um, we implement the evidence and take that knowledge to health systems performance and um, 
But then we generate data. We know when we do systematic reviews, there's a lot of missing, there's a lot of insufficient information, there's gaps on populations, um, there's gaps in real world evidence. There's also lots of gaps on how do we actually implement um, evidence. So we can g gather that data and then generate new data which then can feed new um, systematic reviews. So what are the hallmarks of a learning health system? And I want you to think about these in terms of, you know, the role of systematic reviews. So leaders are committed to a culture of quality improvement, but evidence is systematically gathered and applied. Clinicians receive new evidence via information technology. So how do we get this evidence to the point of care so that it really benefits um, patients? Clinicians cite evidence and share decision making with patients. Data on care is analyzed and used to improve care, and then outcomes are consistently assessed, protocols reevaluated, and continuous feedback cycle for quality improvement. So I want to share this. This is an article that's in press that I did with uh, Victor Montori, where we tried to develop a framework for evidence implementation and generation in um, learning health systems. And I think what's different about this model, there's a lot of people doing work on data predictive analytics, how do you improve care, how do you gather data from health systems. And then there's a whole other um, group of people who work on patient-centeredness, um, the caring aspect. And the two are pretty separate. And this was an attempt to kind of integrate the caring and the data side of uh, health systems improvement. But if you just kind of, just quickly, to think about it, you assess the problem you know, that somebody brings to you, you identify and use the evidence and you make a decision, you respond. But now we have the capacity to evaluate the outcomes of those choices, produce new evidence, and adapt what we know. So I think the implications for this are twofold. One is that you know, the need for living reviews, that or the rate of evidence generation is, is increasing and we need to figure out a way to keep reviews current. Um, and the other is that we also need evidence on how to implement evidence and models of care, um, as well as, um, you know, the clinical interventions. So many of you are familiar with ARC's EPC program. It's um, actually over 20 years old. It was established in 1997. It supports 12 academic uh, research organizations. I see many of our EPC uh, investigators are here. Um, provide in, and it basically provides independent and unbiased synthesis of evidence, and it partners with external organizations to promote evidence-based decisions. And you know, we started. We have a rich and deep relationships with guideline developers doing systematic reviews to inform guidelines. But more and more, we're partnering with health systems and other kinds of decision makers to synthesize the kind of evidence they need, which entails synthesizing evidence on complex, multifaceted interventions um, and questions that are relevant to um, health systems. For example, we've done reviews on the use of um, telehealth for consultations. We're doing, um, we did one on diabetes apps, social isolation, so very different topics and um, they, we've done in the past. So what are the characteristics of our uh, stakeholders review? They're um, stakeholder driven, we get input on our questions, they're rigorous, and they're independent and unbiased. And you know, many of you know, as an example, we do this, the EPC program actually does the systematic reviews for the US Preventive Services Task Force, which then does make re uh, recommendations about clinical preventive services. Um, including screening, counseling, and preventive medications. And the task force works with ARC um, EPC centers to develop research plans and review the evidence. We have many, many federal partners as well as non-federal partners. Um, uh, uh, many federal agencies come to us and we do systematic reviews for them. Um, through interagency agreements. We're doing a whole, uh, three new ones uh, for the CDC for updating their pain management guidelines. We've done, uh, we're doing a number for NIH, CMS, we do their technology assessments. And then we work with non-federal partners like PCORI where we've done this, um, the series of updated systematic reviews that you have on your chairs. So we know you're gonna hear more about the process of doing good um, systematic reviews from other speakers, but basically, you know, this is from a paper by uh, John Ionatis, 
and he found that 3% of uh, all systematic reviews uh, that were attempted were decent and clinically useful. So they're not all the same. One systematic review, is you've seen one, you haven't seen them all. So why does the quality matter? Low quality systematic reviews can result in biased interpretation due to conflicts of interest, incomplete picture uh, due to non-systematic and skewed uh, search, cherry picking studies to include in the review, inadequate assessment of data quality, evidence strength, or confidence in conclusion, and all of this can actually lead to inaccurate or misleading conclusions. Um, another reason to do systematic reviews is basically knowing when trials are not needed. So, you know, in terms of like efficiency of research dollars, um, this slide is, um, was by Lau in New England Journal. This is an old paper, but what it shows is that there were lots of trials on thrombolytics for myocardial infarction. And by 1980, meta-analysis showed that it works. There were over 200 trials after that. So if somebody had done that, many of those trials, maybe those could have been invested in other kinds of research. So what do we do with the evidence? So the next step is to get it into practice. And um, ARC is tasked under the Affordable Care Act to do dissemination and implementation. And we have a, a transparent pro process to receive nominations of findings where there's a gap in practice and good evidence that could be implemented. And when we get these nominations, we assess the strength of the evidence, impact, potential impact on outcomes, and then the fe feasibility for implementation. And we're, we're rolling out um, some of these uh, topics that have come through these nomination process. We have out on the street now, for any of you who are interested, we'd love to get lots of great applications, a new funding announcement on screening and management of unhealthy alcohol use in primary care. And this actually grew out of two evidence syntheses. The, uh, the Preventive Services Task Force recommends um, you know, screening and brief intervention for unhealthy alcohol use. And the EPC program did a systematic review on treatments for alcohol abuse you know, and delivering MAT in primary care settings, which is effective. So we took that evidence and we're rolling out, um, inter, you know, we're hoping that people will effectively inter um, implement this in practice. We did, last year we released a review on non-pharmacologic treatment of chronic pain, which we did um, sponsored by ASPE and the CDC. And what's interesting, this uh, systematic review found evidence for things like exercise and acupuncture for, for various conditions. And not only is it being used by CDC um, to update their guidelines, but it's being used by um, NIH is sponsoring some trials based on the findings of this, as well as um, CMS is looking into are there ways they could expand coverage for some of these non-pharmacologic interventions. So that's just an example of uptake of systematic reviews. Um, but you know, the, the reports are big, dense. I don't know how many of you have looked at our EPC reports. Sometimes they're difficult to read. They're kind of complicated. And we're really thinking, this is prototypes, but we're looking at ways to how to present the data in a way that's more accessible, usable for people. So this is how we took um, the, as actually the SRC, led by Mark Helfand over there, we can thank him for this, is really looking at how can we visualize this. And this is quite exciting in terms of pulling out the, the different sections of the review so that you could quickly, so this is chronic back pain, it's all the therapies we look at, psychological therapies, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, manual therapies, you know, exercise, massage, et cetera. And you can look at the outcome, pain or function, and just drill down on this so you can pull out exactly what you want. And you could also do a tailored evidence summary, so because people have different needs for the evidence. So we're really thinking about how do we make this evidence more usable, accessible to get it into practice. And then, you can actually drill down. Um, this shows um, the outcomes for studies for exercise and low back pain. And you can right away drill down and get all the details on, on, on the summary and the different studies. So I think there's a huge role in the future for you know, interactive data visualization around the um, reviews. The other thing is we imagine, um, we envisualize a seamless like information ecosystem that goes from the the studies, the systematic reviews, to the um, 
guidelines to clinical decision support. And when, as this stuff becomes computable, um, it'll all be able to be put in the same place. So basically, we have a big initiative around clinical decision support. And this is not your old annoying clinical decision support. It's how do you incorporate this in workflow so that it's actually useful. And basically, we have a newly um, released clinical decision support on opioid management. And it was user-driven in deciding it. It was based on the CDC guidelines. And basically, what it does is it consolidates patient-centered information found all over an EHR on one screen. And it was piloted in community health centers, so we reached, you know, disadvantaged populations. So what does the pain management summary show? It shows medical history, pain proms, pain assessments, historical treatments, risk for abuse. So it's just, there's ways, and that, the next step is to also to link this to guidance for, for prescribing. So I think, you know, thinking about the uses of um, systematic reviews will make them more and more impactful. So that's all I wanted to say, and, you know, sort of the why we're doing it, it's all about achieving the quadruple aim. It's delivering better, higher quality care, better patient experience, lower cost, but also reducing the burden on, on um, providers. Um, our website, you can find our evidence reports. You can sign up for the listserv and get notices about new reports coming out. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, and I should say, so I'm going to have to leave a little before 11, but Jill Hubert is right here from ARC. She's one, one of the uh, medical officers for the EPC program, so she could answer any kind of questions that come up related to ARC's work. Good morning. Um, I'm going to give a very high-level overview of what systematic reviews are, the basic steps in them, and some applications using um, examples from the work that the Duke EPC has done. My disclosures, learning objectives for those of you getting CME. So what is a systematic review? Traditionally, when many of us were in medical school, we had narrative reviews by a learned professor of, on, a, on a specific topic, and often the topic was quite broad. Systematic reviews are different in that they're very focused on a specific topic or question. The methods used to do the review are very explicit. In the, kind of the classic review articles, there often wasn't a formal approach to identifying the literature, to abstracting the literature to, to grading the quality. All those methods are very explicit. The results of a systematic review are usually quantitative, not always, but there, there, there's some aspect that is often quantitative. And the conclusions are data-driven, as opposed to, as the phrase, I think, when evidence-based medicine first came out, that the traditionally it had been eminence-based medicine, where the, where the strength of evidence was based on the number of gray hairs in the in the uh, at professor's head, or actually were perhaps the fewest hairs. Um, so definitions, a systematic review or literature synthesis is a summary of the scientific evidence about a specific question that's obtained in a systematic way. A meta-analysis is a subset where that, and that's a specific technique for combining the data quantitatively from multiple studies. 
there are some subsets of that. And again, this is not a totally comprehensive description of all the possible methods. There's a network meta-analysis, which allows you to combine data from both direct and indirect comparisons. So for example, if you have three interventions of interest, and there are direct comparisons of A and B and B and C, a network meta-analysis would make, allow you to make some inferences about the comparative effectiveness of A and C. And then there are patient-level meta-analysis, which combines the patient-level data from individual studies. So graphically, you can think of it that way. Now, now many um, of the EPCs, ours included, often include some other kind of simulation model. It could be a decision analysis. It could be cost-effectiveness analysis. It could be some other way of combining the evidence that's separate from the meta-analysis. And that can be particularly helpful in settings where you're trying to balance harms and benefits and try to get net effects. Because the individual studies may only have in information on specific outcomes. And in the, particularly in the context of guideline development, you're interested in balancing the benefit and harms. And often the only way to synthesize that is with some other kind of model. So for example, we did a review for the CDC who were interested in the question of whether women should consider using oral contraceptives as primary prevention for ovarian cancer, since there aren't any non-surgical approaches to preventing ovarian cancer. And there's, there is some evidence that women who use oral contraceptives have a reduced incidence of ovarian cancer. But oral contraceptives obviously have lots of other potential harms. So we did a series of meta-analyses of the evidence on both those non-contraceptive benefits as well as the harms. But the only way to put that together to say on net, is it worth doing this, is with a simulation model. When should a review be done? Well, classically, when there are several studies addressing the same question using similar methods that yield different results. And as that classic study showed, if they're all showing the same thing, it's probably not worth doing the meta-analysis. Or if the studies lack the power to detect a clinically important or statistically significant result. And frequently that, that may be with uncommon but important outcomes, such as complications of procedures, where most individual studies, if they're powered based on the improvement in quality of life, may not have enough power to detect differences in important things like uncommon complications or adverse events. They can be done to inform a clinical guidance, guideline or policy, and that can include research prioritization and as background work for major research projects for justifying the need to do the research. So how is the systematic review done? First thing is to make sure someone hasn't already done one. And these are the, the, um, the main databases for identifying um, published reviews. Prospero is somewhat similar, similar to clinicaltrials.gov and that it's a, a prospective registry of, of ongoing systematic reviews. The steps are to formulate the questions search the evidence, abstract the data, synthesize the data, and then summarize the results. And you're going to have a detailed kind of walking through of one, so I've, I've kept this at a very high level. So there's some challenges for, for all these steps. The key questions guide the entire systematic review process, and they need to be clear, precise, and relevant to stakeholders. And then often one of the challenges for, for topics that may involve multiple stakeholders is getting consensus on what those questions are. And that often can be a kind of an ongoing challenge. And, and I think all the EPCs have had um, experience with fighting the, the tendency to, for scope creep as, as questions come up. But the, it's important that the stakeholders and key informants provide context and ensure relevancy and transparency. So that's a, that's a key aspect of it. So I, can, I do a lot of decision analyses, and you know, everything's a trade off. And this is a kind of a, a, an ongoing um, balance. Typically, those key questions are framed in a concept called PICO. So you specify the patients who are the interventions of interest, the comparators, the outcomes of interest, the timing at which you're assessing the outcomes, and then the setting. You search the evidence. The literature, and there are a number of databases, and which databases you use depends on the question. You develop a strategy for deciding which, which studies to include or not include based on the PCOTs, basic study design, some 
systematic reviews will only be randomized trials. Others will by necessity have to include observational studies. Even within, within the observational studies, there may be decisions about what to include and not to include. Restrictions can be based on sample size, country, language, when it was published, the completeness of information, et cetera. There's usually a screening process based on initially a title and abstract, and then of things that make it through that, then go to a full text review. Usually two agree reviewers need to agree. There's a standard form that's developed. And at the end of the day, we summarize the search strategy. This is similar to a consort diagram for a clinical trial of all the studies that were identified and the ones were included and excluded at different stages. So again, challenges is the trade-off between maximizing the likelihood of capturing all the evidence and minimizing the effects of reporting bias, limiting by public, limitations by publication date or language. If you're doing a, um, a, we're finishing up a review on management of labor and it's specifically for a U.S. setting, much of the literature comes from other countries and so there are contexts that are very different in other countries, both developed and um, developing countries that are very different from the US, so that raises some interesting questions. Publication date, you know, if we're interested in long-term effects, uh, the effects of fertility treatment on risk of cancer, it takes 10 to 20 years to see those effects, but the treatments that people are considering now may be quite different than the ones that were there at the time of the, of the cancer studies. So women getting infertility treatment now get very different drugs, regimens than women who are being treated 20 or 30 years ago who are informing the, the estimate of the risk of cancer. Same thing with breast cancer screening. So, so we know that both the technology for mammography as well as the, the impact of treatment on breast cancer mortality is different now than it was at the time of the major trials. And how do you incorporate that uncertainty? Balancing the search terms so that you don't miss anything important, but that you don't have to weed through a huge amount. Abstracting data. Typically, this is a, one person does it. It's overread for a quality check. There are challenges in developing those forms because you want the, the forms to be as good as possible, but you don't want to wait until all, the, all these other important questions have been answered. There's often, despite lots of training, lack of uniformity among people who are doing the abstracting. There's a lot of problems and inconsistency in how the data is reported or defined. And you know, one question is, do you include things that define certain outcomes or procedures differently, or do you exclude them? And there are pluses and minuses of both. There's inconsistencies or missing information on key things in published papers. What if the data you're most interested in is reported graphically? So for example, if you're interested in, if you're doing cancer and most of the data is reported as Kaplan-Meier curves, but you might be interested in some of the intermediary steps along the way, how do you abstract that? Publications from large studies that may have overlapping patient groups. From the, from the EPC process, you may need to make a change in eligibility criteria or methods between when the protocol was developed and when you're actually doing the review. And this takes a lot of work. You finally have the data. Do you synthesize it? Is a quantitative synthesis appropriate? If so, which method? Rating this, even if it's not a quantitative synthesis, you need to rate the strength of the evidence on things like the risk of bias, the precision, the applicability. How do you report the findings? Typically, again, in a, certainly in a quantitative review, you'd have summary results, for some sense of the precision of those results, an assessment of how generalizable the results are to the, again, getting back to you know, non-US studies in the US healthcare setting, the range of outcomes considered, and, and particularly in the, in the context of guidelines, the trade-offs between benefits and harms. There's a stand, just as there is with consort, there's a standard um, process called PRISMA to help improve the quality of review reporting. You need to have consistent messages across conclusions, discussion, and implications for practice and research, and again, that can be 
somewhat of a challenge if there are multiple stakeholders, particularly multiple organizations involved. The reporting should convey in a transparent manner the methods, results, and implications to diverse readers, and obviously that some of this is quite methodologically challenging, and it can be hard to convey that. And it should allow readers to judge the validity of the review, but again, you need to have some understanding of the methods to make that judgment. Other challenges, combining data from diverse study designs. Sometimes that is helpful, but there are challenges to that. What if you can't do a quantitative synthesis because there isn't sufficient data? Or that the, the way the data is available doesn't allow that? How do, what about findings from studies that were ineligible based on your criteria but are prominent in the literature? Or that you know that people will ask, why didn't you include this study? How do you deal with impreci imprecision and inconsistency in findings? How big are the available studies? diversity of comparisons and outcomes for a big topic that can be very difficult to wade through. And again, in the, in the setting of guidelines development, there's a conflict between saying there is just no evidence and people needing to make some kind of decision or recommendation. So how are they useful? In the setting of guidelines, I think they're particularly helpful when there's a formal framework such as GRADE or the one that the USPSTF uses or the one that um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uses. Because a formal review that assesses the strength of evidence helps with, under those frameworks with judgments about the certainty and confidence in the recommendation. Another advantage is that when, when there's differences in guidelines, if they're based on transparent reviews, it can help with understanding the degree to which different groups come up with different guidelines are based on inclusion or exclusion of different evidence, or different judgments about the quality of that evidence, or just differences in values. So we've done reviews for a number of organizations in cancer screening, and it's clear that some organizations have put a higher value on preventing cancer morbidity and mortality than on the potential harms of screening, whereas others come down differently in weighting that even with the, using the same evidence. So a formal process can help with that. Identifying research gaps for prioritization. The areas of greatest uncertainty should be the highest priority for future research. There's potential, again, if other, if formal, um, other kind of simulation models are used, there are formal quantitative methods that help identify priority areas called value of information, and PCORI and ARC have both provided funding for methodologic development in that area. That formal evaluation of the strength of evidence can help identify whether the uncertainty is due to lack of precision. We just need one more randomized clinical trial and then we'll have good confidence intervals. Or is it bias and we need any randomized clinical trial? Or is it the kind of uncertainty I was talking about before where there are huge temporal leaps and we may not ever be able to get a definitive answer and how do we address that kind of uncertainty? Again, another example um, of how a review helped with prioritization, we did a review on management of uterine fibroids um, around two, and subsequently I was followed up by a follow-up with RTI that basically said there was no evidence that led to a prioritization process by ARC, and then, then that led to funding of a prospective registry by PCORI. And again, they can all, you know, in addition to all these kind of typical uses, the methods development, the things that are used to help approach, can have other applications. So the very first review that the Duke EPC did was on different technologies for cervical cancer screening, and Gene Slutsky was the, uh, the officer for that. And as part of that, we built a simulation model, but then that simulation model was subsequently used by some of the companies that were developing vaccines at the time, was used for some guidelines development by both the USPS, USPSTF and other organizations. Other approaches have been, have used, have been used to inform other systematic reviews. So I'll stop there. And I think now we're gonna have a specific walkthrough of someone who struggled with all, an example, specific examples of all these issues. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Valerie Hoffman from RTI International, and like Evan said, I'm going to be walking you through a recent systematic review that we did and talk about some of the challenges that we, um, we ran into along the way. Again, for those of you who are getting continuing education credits, we're gonna talk about the process, identify some of the key challenges, and then report some of the main findings. So PCORI partnered with AHRQ to do an update of a, of a formerly funded AHRQ systematic review that was published in 2013 uh, to look at pharmacological and psychological treatments for PTSD to, a to assist current work on going to update these PTSD treatment guidelines. The prior review had limited findings, so, and we wanted to, they wanted to update um, to see if any new evidence had, had arisen since the last publication um, of the review in 2013, where the studies that were uh, searched for uh, only were, went up till 2012. We also wanted to search for newer treatment types, um, consider other ways to categorize our interventions. So something that was really um, tricky in this review is a lot of times when you're doing mental health reviews and, and looking at mental health interventions, it's very easy to categorize those pharmacological interventions because you have a drug and, and it's one drug name and you can say what class it's in. But when you have those psychological um, interventions, it's really tricky because things like, even things like cognitive behavioral therapy, they involve components of cog cognitive therapy and also behavioral therapy. Um, and then there's all different kinds of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so this was a really tricky thing that we struggled with, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, along the way and how to, how to make sense of, of that data and combining things when you're looking to find out what the outcomes are associated with those particular interventions. We also wanted to search for additional publications looking at subgroup differences in the efficacy or effectiveness of those interventions and also look at those long-term outcomes, which traditionally has been lacking in many of these reviews. So like Evan said, the first step is to define the scope of your, of your review um, and name these key questions. Um, so we had a set of four key questions. Uh, the first focused on psychological interventions, the second on pharmacological interventions, the third on comparative effectiveness of psychological and pharmacological interventions, and the fourth looking at the adverse events or adverse effects associated with those inter interventions so we can weigh the benefits and the potential harms. Um, in addition, we had these subgroups, um, sub key questions for each of the KQ one through three that sought to look at whether there were differences in treatment effectiveness or efficacy by particular uh, subgroups of the population. So for example, um, if males and females have differential efficacy of different treatments or um, type of trauma that were experienced. So as you can imagine, there might be differences between those who experience combat trauma um, versus more uh, interpersonal trauma and also natural disaster trauma, for example. Then the next thing um, was to define the PCOATs, and Evan gave us a little introduction to what those were. So we looked at uh, just adults with a PTSD diagnosis, again, um, some, of, some reviews also uh, allow for different sub-thresholds of, of these diagnoses, but it's really tricky because then that uh, increases your heterogeneity of your, of your population, and it might not, um, the effects that you end up finding may be different than if you started with a group of more severe um, people with PTSD diagnoses. Um, the interventions, again, we specified the specific psychological and pharmacological interventions that we wanted to look at. We defined the comparators of interest, and really we, we uh, didn't, didn't uh, limit that in any way, wait list and treatment um, as usual, usual care, sham and placebo, as well as other inter eligible interventions for our comparative effectiveness studies. 
we define the outcomes of interest um, because sometimes if you don't define the outcomes of interest, you then are left with uh, just a ton of, of information. So you really wanna focus on what is most meaningful for this review. Um, then we set the time frame, so we required at least four weeks of treatment, uh, the settings, and in addition, some of those other parameters that aren't in that acronym, PCOATS, we um, defined the study designs to be randomized controlled trials or um, clinical controlled trials or prospective cohorts with a comparison group with at least uh, an N of 500. Um, or case control with an of at least 500 for our adverse events uh, key question. Then of course, like anything else, we have to draw a pretty picture to show how our key questions and our PCOATs are being defined so that we can have the framework from which we are going to conduct our systematic review. So again, the diagnosed people with diagnoses of PTSD, we would then look at studies that tested one of the interventions and its effects on the outcomes um, that were specified. We also would look at those adverse events of the interventions from KQ4. And for our subgroups of interest, we would look at whether any of those patient characteristics or types of trauma impacted that efficacy or effectiveness. Now for the process. So again, um, we conduct a literature search. Usually we work with a librarian um, in addition to the subject matter experts to define what our search string is going to be and what literature databases we're going to look at. Um, once we obtain the full list of, sometimes it's over 10,000 um, articles that, that we capture from the search process, we then start with our dual review process as Evan talked about a little bit in his um, talk. First, we start with a title and abstract review. So typically, uh, every, every title and abstract are reviewed by two people. Um, so again, sometimes if you are an investigator, you're reviewing 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 of these titles and abstracts. Um, so you, you, you get more efficient as you go, you're able to sometimes quickly look at the title and, and look and see, you know, if it's, if it's not a PTSD population, you can exclude for wrong population. And we record what the reason for exclusion is at that, at that title and abstract um, review period. When at least one person says, yes, move it on to full text review, it goes on to full text review. So at that point, we don't resolve any conflicts. We just say, if one person says it's good enough to go to full text review, then we're gonna pull that full article and look at it in full text review. We then repeat this process uh, for the full text review. Sometimes we have up to a thousand articles that we're looking at the full text so that we can look and see if all of our PCOATs um, are being met and then the, uh, the article is of interest for our review. At that point, everything's done duly and if there are conflicts, we then have the two raters discuss and come to a consensus and sometimes a third party is brought in or it's discussed with the team if, if we're not able to um, come to a consensus between the two people if, if the article should move on. After that, we have the full set of includes that we'll be using as the evidence base and the those articles then go through a risk of bias review. Um, again, duly rated and conflicts are um, resolved through consensus. Um, and then we go on to the abstraction process using the uh, abstraction tools that were set up to guide the review. So for our uh, update, now again, we were just looking at articles published since 2012, so the yield was a little bit smaller than some of our reviews that do not set a specific time point um, or you know, that are from the beginning of time. So we had about 2,300 um, reviews that were, or, or articles that were identified from our search um, that were then screened. Um, we then had about 540 that we reviewed for full text and we ended up uh, including 193 different studies um, that were captured in 207 articles. So again, sometimes there's an index study and multiple publications that come out as companion articles, and so you have to map those together as well. 
for our analysis and reporting, we uh, did a qualitative uh, analysis when there was heterogeneity in the populations, interventions, comparators, outcomes, or timing, and a quantitative analysis, a meta-analysis, when there were three or more similar studies. Um, we also employed the network meta-analysis to examine the comparative effectiveness of the pharmacological interventions from the efficacy studies in order to be able to compare that comparative effectiveness from studies that did not directly look at that. Um, this is really tricky uh, to determine when you can do a quantitative analysis and when you cannot. So heterogeneity in, in populations and interventions, like I talked about before, we really struggled with the categorization of some of our um, psychological treatments. We had, and I'll show you a slide in a minute, a lot of different similar uh, types of treatments that, that included different cognitive components, also different behavioral components. And we started with the framework of the prior review and how they categorized their interventions, but also we were listening to feedback that we got along the way from various um, key informants and, and experts and also just um, public comment that, that we gather during this review process. And we're thinking about different ways that we could possibly categorize um, those interventions to make more sense of the data. Um, again, there's heterogeneity in timing. So if you're looking at um, end of treatment, some treatments could be, the end of treatment could be eight weeks, some could be 16 weeks. Um, you also have follow-up. So do you lump all the follow-ups together or do you have to do you know, one year and one year follow-up? Um, do all of those timings have to be the same across all of your studies? Um, we then grade the strength of evidence for each intervention and outcome um, and assess the applicability and put it out for peer and public review. Um, so we get feedback from all of those people and then um, move on to writing up our findings. So for our psychological efficacy, I'll just show you uh, briefly, this is where some of those uh, treatment types are, are displayed. So cognitive processing therapy, cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure components, cognitive, th expo cognitive behavioral therapy with mixed components. Um, so as you can see, there are a number of similar types of interventions and there's not just one um, set way that is, that is used by all of the researchers out there. Some researchers tend to take components from different interventions and combine them into a new intervention. So what do you do with that information when you're trying to synthesize? How do you look at that? Um, and so we ended up using a very similar um, framework as the prior review in looking at cognitive behavioral therapy mixed components and exposure components separately. However, there is overlap between, between these uh, groups. And there are other ways that, that this data really could have been looked at. Um, and so that just speaks to some of the subjectivity in, in these reviews when there's not a cut and dry way to um, synthesize the information. So if you had a drug, for example, you would know that you had the same drug in the two trials and you could combine them. But even then, sometimes there are differences in dose or frequency of taking and things like that that, that presents heterogeneity. So um, anyway, we found high strength of evidence for reduction in PTSD-related outcomes for CBT exposure and also CBT mixed treatments. Um, moderate strength of evidence for those PTSD-related outcomes for CPT, C, um, cognitive therapy, EMDR, and narrative exposure therapy. And we found few um, comparative effectiveness um, trials of, of psychological treatments, but we found moderate strength of evidence favoring CBT exposure over relaxation therapy for reducing um, PTSD-related outcomes. On the pharmacologic side, again, we had a number of different drugs that were tested by the investigators of the studies that were included in our review. And we found moderate strength of evidence um, for three different drug types, fluoxetine, paroxetine, and venlafaxine. We also found low strength of evidence for a number of other uh, 
drugs in different classes. Our network analysis, this is a picture of our network analysis. So you can see that there are 33 trials that uh, provided evidence um, for this analysis, um, including 13 active treatments. So the line there becomes darker with um, multiple studies testing the differences between, for example, sertraline and placebo. Um, there were many studies that looked at that and, and how many patients, so they were representing um, 1,085 patients um, from sertraline. You then look at the, uh, the ones that are the sertraline versus venlafaxine, for example. That was a comparative effectiveness study that directly um, gave inputs into our analysis. Oops. And then you are left with um, this uh, forest plot of, uh, of evidence so that you can look and see what is, uh, what is effective and what isn't with each of the drugs that were examined in all of your included trials. So only two head-to-head -head trials were tested um, looking at venlafaxine and sertraline. Um, there was moderate strength of evidence for no difference in depressive symptoms and low strength of evidence for no difference in PTSD symptoms, quality of life, or disability. Um, our network meta-analysis found no significant differences between um, the three different uh, pharmacologic interventions that we found to have moderate strength of, of evidence, so fluoxetine, paroxetine, and venlafaxine. We had very few um, insufficient evidence, just one study testing of psychological versus pharmacological treatment. Um, most of our evidence for adverse effects came from our pharmacological studies. Um, most of our studies did not use systematic methods to assess the adverse effects, especially with the, uh, associated with the psychological treatments. Um, we found insufficient evidence for all serious adverse effects, and um, among the treatments with at least moderate strength of evidence of benefit, the only adverse event that we identified uh, as having a moderate strength of evidence was nausea associated with venlafaxine. So this information is helpful when you're trying to weigh the pros and cons of using different types of treatments. So like the prior review, we found insufficient evidence of subgroup differences um, and also insufficient evidence of those long-term outcomes, including um, we found no new studies looking at some of the newer treatments that we looked at um, since our prior review. And therefore, the uh, end conclusion of, of our review um, was largely unchanged. This doesn't mean, though, that there are not important takeaways um, from the review. So there are uh, different conclusions that can be made for different stakeholders, even when you don't find a change from, from the prior review. So for example, for clinicians, we still know that there's uncertainty about the selection of treatment that's most efficacious for particular patients. Um, which suggests that uh, other factors, um, looking at the patient and their needs, um, their access and, and affordability of treatment, their preferences um, should be used um, to determine what kind of treatment might be most efficacious. Um, for policymakers, we know that there's robustness of these findings um, in that they were similar to our prior findings and also similar to the reviews that are have been conducted by other large organizations such as the American Psychological Association and the VA, um, and also it identifies priority funding needs. And for researchers, it speaks to many things that can be done um, to help advance the field. Looking at these newer treatments, again, the treatment landscape is changing rapidly, um, and the new as new treatments are rolled out um, and used, you know, we have to look at those, those treatments. Um, to add to our evidence base, uh, more comparative effectiveness studies, so look, looking at whether head-to-head um, -head studies uh, have any differences in outcomes, more long-term outcomes, differences among subgroups, of course, um, including you know, treatment exposure, types of treatment exposure, uh, and looking at the efficacy and effectiveness of various components of psychological treatment. So 
even though the author might call it CBT exposure or CBT, a mixed CBT, you can actually get at the components sometimes of, of, the, um, of the individual treatments and try to piece out what are those components that are driving um, those, those outcomes. And there are ways that, that can be done. Um, there are new methods that are being developed to be able to do that. Um, also to search and systematically record these adverse effects and adverse events so that we um, have a full picture of what those um, risks and harms are associated so that we can weigh the benefits with them and also to consider the use of common data elements so that when people do conduct these systematic reviews, um, there's a better way of combining the data. All right, and that's all I have for you today. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Jean and her staff at PCORI for um, including ACOG in this discussion. Um, I feel like we've been um, partners with ARC and, uh, and now PCORI for quite a while, so we appreciate the opportunity to, to sort of share our experiences. Um, so you've heard a lot of work from other people um, who actually contribute an incredible amount to what ACOG does. So. Um, my job today is to sort of walk through then what happens after all of this hard work goes into developing these systematic reviews, how it gets translated um, to some extent into uh, clinical practice and for patient care. So um, I thought I'd walk through a little bit about ACOG's uh, document development process, our guidelines development process, and then sort of talk about how the systematic reviews have uh, fit into that. So um, ACOG started our clinical practice guidelines series in 1998. We have published uh, over 200 titles since we started. Some are revisions, but many are new. Um, currently, we have uh, 80 practice bulletins um, in circulation covering uh, both OB and GYN topics. Um, so the structure I have, I have the IOM uh, clinical practice guidelines, we can trust methodology, so I thought I'd walk through each of those steps um, to talk a little bit about our process. Um, so um, the transparency part, um, the methodology we have published on each of our guidelines, and it's also posted on the website. We're in the process of updating our guidelines process as well, so they'll be, um, we'll actually publish our new process um, when that is finalized. Conflict of interest, uh, the chairs and the authors of our standing committees um, are required to have no conflicts. Um, we avoid, we uh, assess conflicts of interest two to three times per year to sure, ensure that no new conflicts have arisen, um, and we accept no external funding uh, for our guideline development. Um, the, our guidelines are developed by two uh, standing committees, one um, with uh, staff with gynecologists and the other with obstetricians. Um, each uh, committee also has two public members uh, that we have uh, recently brought on. Um, some are patients, some are uh, allied health professionals. Um, we have sort of a range of different um, individuals that we've included as part of this public membership to help inform our, our guidelines. Uh, the, uh, the groups meet in person a few times a year, and uh, they also um, have various conference calls and whatnot, and are made up of uh, generalist obstetrician gynecologists, and also um, include people with um, expertise in some of the subspecialties of um, urogynecology and maternal fetal medicine um, and other. And we also, um, to broaden our scope, we also um, collaborate with um, some of our sister organizations of these subspecialties of, obst of obstetrics and gynecology um, and also with other medical specialty societies, um, including uh, AIUM, uh, the ultrasound group, and the American College of Radiology are two groups that we partner with rather frequently. So um, 
this is where the systematic review part comes into play. So um, we do our own, our guidelines are broader oftentimes than the actual systematic reviews that we incorporate. So um, we do our own um, in-house evidence review um, as part of the, the evidence analysis um, based on the PICO, now PCOTS, um, elements that we have identified. Um, and then the, um, the lit searches that are done by our in-house librarians are um, organized by staff according to the quality of the evidence. And obviously the systematic reviews play a key role in, um, in our analysis and are, are really the anchor for, uh, for the rest of the guidelines that we uh, develop. So um, our review methodology is based on a sort of older version of the uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Um, we're in the process, as I said, of updating our methodology. So um, we'll have some new elements that we've incorporated. Um, but the evidence, um, but as we go through the lit search, then the evidence is identified um, and uh, based on the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria that we had um, already agreed upon and then um, we um, use that to directly link uh, the evidence to our recommendations. And the guidelines author, we have a separate st uh, content expert standing author who um, will then review the list of references and develop the manuscript and then the committee, again, with expertise in content and in um, methodology will um, review to ensure that the recommendations are based on the best available evidence. Our recommendations currently are um, graded by uh, level ABC, um, which is um, similar to the task force um, that uh, based on good consistent evidence, which um, has come to mean a systematic review or randomized trial, um, linear and consistent, which is often um, observational studies, and then um, we also leave room to incorporate expert opinion, uh, especially for some of the clinical questions that, um, that really need, that clinicians need guidance about, but there's really not uh, sufficient evidence, but we certainly try to limit those as best we can. Um, then uh, we have two bodies of uh, external or, or internal um, review. We actually don't do, I mean, it's external to the committee, so I guess we could say it's external review, but really it's, it's internal to ACOG. Um, we have a content expert body that um, reviews each of our guidelines, and then the executive board uh, reviews for, uh, the full executive board reviews all of our guidelines for content and also for any policy implications for the organization as a whole. And then updating our guidance, um, we, um, all, the, all of our uh, clinical practice guidance, all the practice bulletins are published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, we review all of our guidelines every 18 to 24 months. Um, the, the standing committees that develop them review them every 18 to 24 months um, at their in-person meeting. Um, and uh, identify, and also uh, a literature search is done at that same time to um, ensure that any new evidence is captured as part of that discussion. Uh, the, the driver really for whether things get updated are um, related to any change in clinical recommendations. And um, there's always new studies, clearly, and there's always new evidence uh, for just about every topic that we cover, but really the driver of, of updating um, has to really be prompted by a change in recommendation, or we'd be at work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so, so, so now to talk a little bit about um, how the ACOG, ARC, and PCORI uh, interaction has, got, has gone on. So um, as I said, we've been working with ARC for a very long time, since 1998, since the very um, beginning of their um, evidence-based practice centers. Um, we've worked to nominate topics. Um, we have participated in the technical expert panels and um, have reviewed the final reports and certainly put them into practice as well. Um, we've partnered with many of the EPCs, just a few to name, Duke and UNC, um, RTI, Vanderbilt, OHSU, so many. Um, so I feel like we're one sort of connected family at some point. Um, although I think I've talked to most people on the phone and not met anybody in person, so it's, 
it's nice to, to actually put a, a face with the voice. Um, and we also review the task force uh, recommendations that, that come out of the EPC, that are based on the EPCs. Uh, so systematic reviews. Um, we have, um, as I said, we've nominated topics, so we've been involved in the, in the, the process. Um, and, and as was described, as Valerie described, that, that there was, you know, it's, it's certainly a lot of work, and we sort of are um, given the opportunity not to get down into the weeds, but to sort of float in um, with some overarching expertise and, and not review thousands and thousands of articles ourselves. Uh, so thank you. Um, so what we, what ACUG's role is really to provide a sort of, to make sure that the, that the way the systematic reviews are done, that there's actual clinical relevance um, to the, the, um, the questions that are asked and um, that, that there's some operational results that, that practitioners can use um, with their patients. So um, because you can answer a question with evidence doesn't mean it's an important question to answer. So we try to, um, we usually sort of step back and frame the questions first of what clinical management questions do we want to answer, and then the next question is, is there evidence to answer those? And um, if there is, then those become the sort of foundation for the systematic reviews. Uh, so the authors that we have, the authors and committee members that we have are involved in all the stages of the systematic review. Um, they um, develop the clinical questions. They review um, some of the, uh, the PCOT elements um, to ensure, again, that, that things are clinically meaningful. And um, they, uh, then the, um, the system, the resulting systematic review really becomes that anchor for our clinical practice guidelines. We uh, occasionally have to, you know, there's, there's always questions outside the scope of the systematic review. So we try to anchor firmly our guidelines in that systematic review and then, um, do our best to sort of address in any way that we can uh, based on evidence about some of the other clinical questions that, um, that still exist. So um, over the course of time, we have um, over 20 practice bulletins that are based on um, the ARC EPC systematic reviews, just a few examples there. They're obviously both on GYN and OB topics. Um, and some of them uh, are updates of, of previous practice bulletins. So we've continued to refine our, uh, our guidance based on new topics. And we have nominated um, several topics, uh, two of which are, are currently in process right now. Um, so uh, the other thing, um, so we also use the systematic reviews, not just for our clinical practice guidelines, but, but also for some ancillary products that we have. Um, we have another series called Committee Opinions, which as you can imagine is not terribly evidence-based um, all the time. Um, but th it, there's some s clinical questions that, that do um, have evidence. They're sort of smaller focused uh, questions, so we have an opportunity to use some of the systematic reviews to inform those, uh, those documents. We've used systematic reviews for uh, task force reports. Um, the hypertension and pregnancy was, um, was actually a WHO systematic review, but um, was very um, foundational in that report. Um, we have patient safety checklists. We have lots of patient education information, all derivative from these uh, clinical practice guidelines um, based on the systematic review. So it really does, the systematic reviews don't just stop with clinician education, it really does trickle down into all kinds of other patient-centered tools that um, ACOG develops. So um, in, um, so I just, and I, I just want to sort of make the point that, um, that, that this really does have this sort of ripple effect. And I think, um, and ACOG, ARC, and now PCORI have, um, or ARC and, and PCORI have now, they've been a really beneficial partnership. I feel like it's informed not only clinician practice, but but really um, the effects on patients. Um, and I think it's driven a reduction in variations in practice and that the, really the evidence-based focus of, of OBGYN management has really been greatly improved. So thank you.
So I would really like the panelists to come and sit up here. Um, it's easier to answer questions. And um, so I, I think, do you want to come up uh, representing AHRQ since um, I think that, that probably will help. Um, so this is a, a, great, um, a great session for those of us who really like systematic reviews. This is <laughs> nice to, to hear how they're used. Um, you know, and, and uh, Evan, thanks for reminding me that um, I was involved over 20 years ago, which makes me feel a little old. Um, but I will say I ran into um, the former head of the CDC's Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program, and they tell me a variation of that model is still in use. So there's a lot of enduring um, aspects of systematic reviews and derivative products. So I think that's something we all can um, celebrate. So right now I'd like to um, open up the session for questions and comments from the audience. We have microphones right there and right there and if you need someone to come and uh, bring you a mic, just raise your hand and we have folks that have access to roaming mics. So let's start over here. Hi, I'm Doug Zatzik and uh, wear a number of hats, but within PCORI I'm involved in the healthcare systems portfolio and the evidence to action network, which is a uh, group of, uh, a large group of acute care and other sort of care transition investigators working in, um, you know, emergency departments and trauma centers. So I have a question for Dr. Hoffman, but it, it does go to the entire group. So, you know, we, we've noted for, you know, decades now in acute care settings that uh, the systematic reviews we get are often sort of session-based cognitive behavioral therapy um, where you have to make it not from the emergency department but to an office somewhere. And we, we did a, a, just a lot of work for a decade with, with very senior folks like a senior epidemiologist, Tom Kepsel, in our group showing that there was a construct, population impact, that um, took the effect sizes, the classic systematic, but, but combined it with breadth of applicability or reach. And we did a number of, of methods, you know, so theoretical epidemiology, Tom derives from the weighted average rule of disease rates, sort of this, this, these very nice formulas that, that could be applied to systematic reviews. And, and so, the, the, and, 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 and other groups, I don't know if you've seen the Gumara at all, the Australians are very interested in this because um, so often in, in, in post-traumatic settings, you don't, it's globally or, you know, re returning from deployment. So this, this literature has been out there and now in quantitative reviews in pretty conservative journals, annual review of psychology, the, the meta-analyses are combining breadth of applicability and population impact with effect sizes. So the, the question is, because we're, we're working with PCORI, we talk about this a lot, we put the literature out there, what, what are the mechanisms for, and we're, you know, in the, in the classic PCORI tradition, we're more grassroots, we've got stakeholders who are working on American College of Surgeon guidelines, we've got patient stakeholders in the American Trauma Society, and, and often the systematic review process is more of a top-down. What are the mechanisms in your, in your systematic review groups for sort of capturing these, these innovations in implementation science that might sort of enhance the uptake and applicability of your reviews? Sorry okay. about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, your we, question. We haven't thought it, but, and I, I, you, you, it looks like you're reviewing th hundreds, if not thousands, of articles. So Absolutely, yeah, but yeah. your question is, is, is a critical one because what we do in systematic reviews, we, we prescribe a very, it's, it's a, a very set A, B, C, D, you know, formula. Yes, it's a formula. So we, we, we make up, you know, what the PCOs are going to say, and then we say, is this study in or is this study out? And a lot of that context and contextual factors like you're talking about and, and what is the best reach for these um, interventions and how do those things get implemented becomes lost because you're just focusing on the one formula and you're taking those, um, those studies and trying to make a conclusion out of them. Um, we do employ different um, inputs along the way, if you will. So we have key informants who help. Um, we put it out for, for public comment, peer review, things like that. But that's really um, working with a large group of people who have those different, um, different levels of expertise, mm -hmm. I think is really critical because you can do a systematic review in a vacuum, in a box, and say, okay, these are the included studies and those studies don't get included. But really, 
being able to speak to um, yeah. what the next step is. Did, and, didn't and mean to put you on the, the take home, and I think where the where the sort of synthesis is for for sort of the, the folks on the ground doing the grassroots sort of dissemination. It, it, it applies to the American College of uh, Obstetricians. There there are implementation science innovations. The American College of Surgeons has a make it happen uh, sort of context where they're, they're just waiting for reviews and then they can regulate acute care settings. This goes back to papers by Teresa Greenhall and Milbank Quarterly, you know, from, from implementation science. So these innovations, and, and the, the, the point is to get the guidelines into practice sooner so you can cut down on the time. Mm -hmm. and, and there's just a lot being generated. Sorry to, yeah. yeah okay. No, it was a great question. Does anyone else want, have any other comments? I mean, I, th I think, you know, one of the other challenges, though, is that people make decisions on things other than evidence. And, you know, cancer, cancer screening is a perfect example, and, and despite you know, in, in breast and cervical cancer is a great example, despite lots of evidence that the balance of benefit harm uh, and harms is not favorable for very frequent screening. It's very hard for patients to give that up. It's very hard for providers to give that up f on a number of different domains. And so uh, uh, there are these ongoing challenges beyond just getting the actual evidence mm -hmm. to the people in the street. Mm -hmm. I'll just, uh, oh, from an ARC perspective, I'll just point out that um, one of the me things that Arlene mentioned in her slide was the inverted triangle of going from, from evidence to saying where's the gap and what needs to be implemented. Because sometimes we get systematic reviews that kind of reinforce what we're already doing. We, we really don't have anything new or actionable from, from a systematic review. And other times you get a systematic review that says we should stop doing this now and, 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 and or we should do more of, of this now. And, and that piece of, of what should we train, what should we implement based on the systematic review is coming through some of the stuff that ARC is moving towards with our implementation initiative and really the mission of PCORI, I think. So um, I, I kind of feel still that the evidence review needs to come first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mark. yeah, I'm Mark Helfand and also wear too many hats to really pick one here. <laughs> but at uh, so we discussed the, the, the issue the last questioner brought up, or one of the issues he brought up. You know, we, we discussed that in a panel at the um, Academy Health Dissemination, Dissemination and Implementation meeting, uh, I guess last January. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the things that we, and Jeremy Grimshaw led that um, panel, I was on it, and Austin Frack was on it, a couple other people. You weren't on it, were you? No. Okay. So, and, and uh, you know, the, we, we wrestle with the question, when it comes to the implementation side, are we talking about looking at evidence about implementation along with looking at evidence of clinical effectiveness, or are we talking about it in a different way? Are we, are we talking about uh, implementation as things you try to make it happen? and you gain know-how, kind of like Picori is doing with engagement strategies, right? There's a session today, what have we learned from trying these different engagement strategies? But, but you know, and, and, and so the, I think the, the main thing I'd say is that systematic reviews don't have to give up context. A certain trend in systematic reviews has led to that phenomenon. It's not intrinsic to systematic reviews to lose context. And if you're working closely with health system customers, basically, uh, you can't really lose context. You know, a lot of the reviews I do are in the VA system, and so the context is a much bigger part of the review than the evidence part. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I was going to comment on is just that slide you had of future research and, uh, you know, the ideas for what we would do next. And, and I think this is another thing about the, the way systematic reviews play into decision making. I always thought, you know, systematic reviews tell us tell you what's based on evidence and what's not, but they don't tell you what to do, right. because in medicine, if we, or in healthcare, if we were going to wait until there was perfect evidence for everything, we'd be the last health system on earth to do it. Mm -hmm. And if we were just going to glom onto anything that's new, we'd be doing a lot of stuff. But we have to, we can't set it one way or the other. Guidelines can, especially preventive guidelines, because they're telling everybody, healthy people, you have to, you know, you should do this. But in real healthcare, most of the things are in between. There's not good evidence, but is there something about this, about the evidence, or something about the context that tells us we ought to try it? And so I think, I think we should not make too strong a distinction between things with context and thinking about that and, and, and the reviews. Yeah. 
I mean, I think that's that's an essential point. That that's something that we struggle with at ACOG all the time is that balance of you know there's patients in front of you and there may or may not be high level, very you know high quality evidence. But then then what? You can't you know you have to come up with some sort of way to address that. So I, I think. That, you know the the systematic reviews, like I said, they're they're really the anchor for our clinical practice guidelines. But uh, it, there's just we just have not found a way to get away from some of those other sort of ancillary questions, and so feel like we we have some kind of obligation to to provide some guidance in some way. Hello, I am Brenda Shelton Dunstan. I am um, a chair, co-chair of the Q, a steering committee, and I am also the executive director of the Black Women's Health Alliance in Philadelphia. My question is, and you can tell me if it's appropriate, or, but I think it's timely to follow up some of the information you just said. As far as systematic reviews and study results, and their, and their results, um, have there been results that would be benefit the reduction in the maternal mortality disparity for black women? I mean, and what, is occurring and how can it be further implemented? Looking at those systematic reviews, have there been any? Have we really focused in on that issue? And if not, how could we? Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware certainly of any within the ARC PCORI system. And you know, that's There's a one for the task force. For the task force. The one that I'm thinking of from the task force was on uh, blood pressure screening. Yeah. And since maternal hypertension is, is such a uh, such a serious problem, I, I, the task force did do that recently. That's the only one I can think but, of. But it's but it, that's one of those topics that's yeah. clearly not. There's there's the medical obstetric side. There's the social issues. There's access to care issues. So it certainly would be, you know, probably worthy of multiple systematic reviews to look at this, you know, it's a complex intervention um, mm -hmm. appro approach, yeah. but, but it certainly would be a, a high priority, it certainly would be a good high priority topic. All right, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Laura Williams and I'm a health educator and my question is for Dr. Myers and V, um, and Nancy Wortley, uh, Senior Director, um, uh, and I basically have a question about resources for um, ambulatory care practice managers. I am part of a couple of PFACs, and in one PFAC meeting, uh, ambulatory care managers walked in saying that they wanted to show the PFAC patient and uh, family council committee a questionnaire that they'd come up with to ease the burden of the call center that was taking a lot of questions from patients. So they led with that rather than with any kind of patient customer service in mind. And with the questionnaires um, lineup, you could see that there was a jumble of information that wasn't set up to let one know whether the patient should receive said questionnaire at the beginning of their appointment, a check-in, while in the clinical encounter or afterwards. So I'm hoping that your slides are available because I feel that what the ambulatory care manager shared with us that they pulled data from the hospital in Press Ganey wasn't enough to develop this questionnaire that had questions on it in such a jumbled fashion that we as the PFAC couldn't even determine when they plan to implement the uh, supposed patient resource. So first of all, will you provide your slides? And then secondly, like where can these ambulatory care managers get probably better data so that they could better formulate and map out their questionnaire? So I'll answer the slide question. They will be available on the Cori website. Okay. That's the easy question. <laughs> so are you talking about the PTSD? No, no, um, this was um, at uh, Cornell Wheel uh, Medical oh. Center and there were uh, emergency ambulatory care practice managers that wanted to, um, you know, again, they said start with ease the burden on the call center, uh, but they had a list of questions that were for the patient, but 
the questions were so jumbled, again, that we as the patient reviewers couldn't tell whether we were supposed to get this resource when we first walked into the ER triage or, you know, during uh, the appointment or after and uh, outside of the ER at different specialist locations throughout the hospital. So it almost seemed like they just didn't know what to do with their data. They didn't maybe get it from the right place. And I would like to bring uh, resources back to them to say, hey, if uh, this is what you want to do for us, maybe you should be looking someplace else for uh, yeah, data. So, so, so <laughs> basically, they should have done a better review yeah. process before <laughs> developing that product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly these slides are available. There are a number of online resources from the Cochrane's um, and on, on how to do reviews, there are, there are short courses available to do, um, and I'm sure there must be somebody at Cornell who'd be available as a local resource. That's okay. often the best way to do it. So Cochrane has a consumer database as well, mm -hmm. and they actually may have some systematic reviews on um, survey design questionnaire and when it's best to do it in the ambulatory encounters. So that would be one place to start. Okay. Um, and a uh, Cochrane consumer is, is free and open to the public. Okay, thank you. Um. Yes, I'm Janet McCauley. I'm Senior Medical Director at Blue Cross North Carolina. I'm also an obstetrician gynecologist and do some work at Duke and at ACOG, so I know some <laughs> of you very well. So my question really has to do more with the process of doing a systematic review. Um, and this leads to a consistency question. One is there's such a massive amount of literature and you have to boil it down um, and everyone has sort of their prioritization and what you include and exclude. Um, <clears throat> but that can actually also drive a lot of variation in the output. We get a lot of questions at our plans about why some payers cover certain things and don't cover, and the same item is not covered by one plan, it's covered by another one. And the evidence is the same, but it's really how it's prioritized, how it's identified, and how it's boiled down. We have conversations about this all the time at Evidence Street at the Blue Cross Association. But I'd like just to ask the whole group, um, what are the differences among these different organizations who all do systematic reviews because the payers tap into those reviews to pull up our own guidelines, and there's bound to be some differences that lead to different conclusions that when payers take, it, the evidence is the same. It's, it's got to be how it's looked at and how it's prioritized, but I'd love some feedback from all of you on that. So, I, I mean, I, I'd say it's, it's a number of things. So some of it is what evidence to include and what isn't. And, and part of that, there, there's a methodologic component to that. There's a, if you don't include certain types of evidence, you may not be able to even get any kind of answer. Some of it's driven by the stakeholders who are involved, who feel very strongly that certain types of evidence should at least be considered and reviewed. Um, some of it is um, things that may or may not be included in the review, so many of the reviews don't specifically include cost effectiveness, um, particularly depending on who the, who the funder is, so that may or may not be explicitly there. Some of it is um, the evidence can be similar, but people have different values on, I mean, and again, I mean, sc mm -hmm. screening is the perfect example for that, of how different stakeholders place different values on preventing a death versus false positives and all that that might include. So I don't think there's a, there's a right answer to it. I think that the approach that we try to do is be as transparent as possible and identify things that we didn't, I think everybody does, things that we didn't include or alternative approaches that mm -hmm. would be, have been justifiable. Mm -hmm. So you can see how all of that, if the answer has to be a yes or a no, what side of the line it falls onto is really dependent upon how it's looked at. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and I think that's one of the things that is guideline developers that we've, that we've come across as well. You know, ACOG can have their own view on one particular thing, but if it impacts a, a much broader, um, group of, of uh, physicians, then then it's really just, uh, we're, you know, we're minding our own vein in, in, to some extent. So we have definitely worked more to partner with other organizations to try to come up with a much broader consensus and to, to avoid some of that because, you know, patient, you're getting different 
care depending on which kind of provider you see. So we've done a lot more work to try to broaden our, our inclusion. About right, and we see that at the payers as well. So mm -hmm. another caveat of that, given how labor intensive all this is, and it sounds very manual, is there anything that's you know process-wise that is being looked at for um, you know automating at least at the initial screening levels? It just you know there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of things you all have to wade through, and it takes forever. Um, what's the state of the art on that? <laughs> well, so I see someone. You oh. want to answer that? Oh, I, go I, ahead. I yes, Mark, please. Mark, yeah, yeah. Up and down. Definitely. And I can yeah. answer cartwheels and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that all of the organizations um, doing systematic reviews um, have um, really caught on to is a need for innovation in the parts of the systematic review process that could be automated. And those are the parts that you referred to, the searching and sifting through tons of stuff. So Arlene mentioned um, living systematic reviews. Um, last year, uh, Cochran and Robert Wood Johnson um, worked um, with us to do two living systematic reviews, and their scientific point of that project was to test crowdsourcing through Cochran Crowd and uh, to expand Cochran's machine learning techniques to try to do those first steps. And we did two living reviews, one on getting kids to eat fruits and vegetables, which was done in Australia. And the other one was essentially an update of a task force report on, on screening for lipids in children and tried to see what's the, how, how much time does this save, what's the accuracy of it compared to the manual process and so on. And I thought it was really quite exciting, especially the Cochrane Crowd stuff, which I understood better, you know, as far as a mechanism for, for engagement in science, not just a, a, a way of getting things sped up. Mm. And, and so we also created some modules, or actually Cochrane in the UK, the, our partner there, created some modules to sort of learn more about what you're, what you're doing here when you're trying to classify studies. At ARC, uh, even uh, the VA, um, Cochrane, are really trying to go all over on, on getting this done. I'd say Cochrane has a, a good head start on some of it, but you saw that Arlene is talking about doing some living reviews, and in the VA, we're just starting one as well. When we say living reviews, we often mean employing these technologies to do the parts that can be automated so that we have more time to think about the studies and, and synthesize them. Okay, I'm Moaz Abdelbadoud. I'm postdoc fellow at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. My main area of interest is hepatitis C management among people who inject drugs. And since 2014, we have the directly acting antivirals for hep C management. And the best practices actually are now for integration of services, hep C management with substance abuse management and syringe exchange. So this integration actually is one component from patient-centered care. How can, or maybe what is the role of systematic reviews in modification of care or leveraging of care, not just from integration of services f towards patient-centeredness. I mean, how can sy systematic reviews help modify these models of care, help improve decision-making, help add some self-management components, maybe patient activation components, other components like peer support and family support. So what is the role of systematic reviews and help modification these models of care? take a stab, but this sounds to me like trying to evaluate complex interventions, and, and maybe you guys have more experience. It's difficult to evaluate complex interventions, and then hopefully if, if we learn to evaluate that um, in one way, with, with kind of a, a methodologic challenge, I'm pointing at wherever Mark went, um, th it requires a different methodologic approach, and, and so we, hopefully we could learn um, the easiest systematic review is, you know, I have a drug, I want to see the outcome but then the more complex, I think the ones that you were describing right. about mental health treatments and having different components of, mm -hmm. you know, what do you call cognitive-based therapy versus one of the other therapies, mm -hmm. we're kind of getting at that complex intervention. So I think that's probably where it's going. Yeah. That's what I was gonna say, and there are methods that are being developed to be able to, to, to piece that stuff out um, so that you can hone in on what those components are of those complex interventions. Okay. 
Is this kind of methodologically sound if I'm going to evaluate patient-centeredness in these interventions and maybe compare these to the outcomes, this kind of methodologically sound? To evaluate patient-centeredness, even if we have like these eight principles of patient-centeredness and try to analyze the interventions based on this perspective and see if these patient-centeredness, I would say scoring for patient-centeredness for each intervention is associated or maybe correlated with the outcomes? Is kind of mythological sound? For so are you, are you talking about looking to see if specific patients with specific characteristics may do better or worse? I mean the patient-centeredness in the intervention. So I'm comparing the patient-centeredness in the interventions and see if this patient-centeredness is associated in a way with the outcomes of these interventions. Mm -hmm. The intervention is the model of care, which is integration yeah. of services, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and that could be one component that you look yeah. at in, in your in your analysis of, okay. of those. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. So I just would like to ask a question on the panel. And, I, you know, Arlene put up a slide that I've seen as a very pr provocative slide where John Ioannidis said that only 3% of systematic reviews are published um, that are, are trustworthy. And I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on did he pull out narrative reviews or did he lump narrative reviews with systematic reviews? And what impact do you think um, the IOM standards and then ultimately um, PCORI standards for methodological, uh, for um, systematic review might have had on the field? And then finally, what role do journal editors have in um, making sure that systematic reviews are, um, are trustworthy? Oh, we can go <laughs> Hi, I'm gonna we can just go down the line. I'm gonna be Arlene Bierman here. Um, <laughs> Um, the good news is I'm fairly new to ARC, and I at one point said, well, it's a trustworthy review, right, because we published it. And my boss said, well, why don't we look more closely? And, um, but there are standards for how to evaluate uh, systematic reviews now. And that, uh, as I said, they seem to be, um, have come along the, the line so that you can say, it. and, and I was given the task of looking at different reviews and saying, you know, does this follow, is there, there's a checklist, did they explain what they were gonna do, did they set things a priori, you know, and that um, increased my confidence that the systematic review was of higher quality. So I think there have been some standards set. I don't know when Dr. Yanides published that statement. <laughs> Cindy, do you know when that, that journal article came out? Yeah, wow. I think it was 16 or so. Oh, oh pretty recent. Yeah, 15 or 16. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry, my name's Malcolm. I'm the CEO of Cochrane. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought I recognized you, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm not going to get into a scientific debate with John. With John. No, no way. Um, I, th I think one of his, his pr we would say at Cochrane, obviously, not all systematic reviews are the same, self evidently. Right. Uh, and that's why the methodological rigor is, is, is so critical. But I think John was also using it to, 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 to make the point that, uh, you know, if not all trials are made available so that they can be incorporated in systematic reviews, mm -hmm. then the quality Five. of the systematic reviews is gonna be right. fundamentally flawed. Um, and so, you know, let's say everybody in this room and everybody in PCORI really gets into the all, all trials uh, and mm -hmm. making sure that all trials that are conducted are made available, that, uh, that systematic reviewers can then draw on them and so forth, then we're all going to be in a better place, which, and that includes Cochrane reviews and it includes non-Cochrane reviews. So, I mean, I think that will be the place to start. Uh, we are, you know, are always self-critical and always trying to make our methods better to make sure that our systematic reviews are the best that they can be. But fundamentally, if you know they're based on 50% of, uh, of inputs and uh, those 50% of inputs might skew the final systematic reviews but we don't have the data to include, include from the studies then of course there's nothing we can do so that's the fundamental point and I think if uh, you know all of us get behind that campaign then we will collectively make systematic reviews far more powerful so Cindy I don't want to call you out um, but do you mind coming to the microphone for a minute I know so Cindy is an accomplished systematic review person herself, but she's also an editor at a top tier peer reviewed journal. Can you, can you comment a little bit about how Annals has approached the, the whole issue of making sure that systematic reviews that are published are of the highest quality? Well, we have our 
peer review systems, uh, and we uh, demand that the systematic reviewers give us all their tables, and we actually look at their tables, <laughs> and we uh, scan some of the articles ourselves that they have reviewed, we find lots of mistakes. We find lots of mistakes. Um, and I'll go back to Anides. I think there's an epidemic, actually, of meta-analyses. Uh, <laughs> and I think that people are just uh, trying to mishmash things together and to do it quantitatively and that uh, there's a bit of recklessness in doing that. So uh, I appreciate what John was saying in a way. I mean, he goes overboard, but I think he was trying to point those kinds of things out. So I think we need to be much more thoughtful in what we're doing. A thing I was going to raise related to the PTSD um, ranking of evidence, actually, is that you called several things moderate strength of evidence. And actually, that body of evidence to me is not substantive yet. Mm -hmm. And I am concerned that many reviewers are overranking their mm -hmm. bodies of evidence and calling this moderate strength of evidence when really it's still fairly scant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true, and it's dependent on what kind of grading system you use, of course. So that's another source of heterogeneity yep. in, in what different reviews find. So it's using that process um, of to determine your final moderate or high or, or low. And of course, there's subjectivity, and, and that's why we try to do it with two people using a, a set criteria. But of course, the criteria could be different, um, and so you could get a different overall result, you're right. And that is true. I've, I've noticed that um, at times where there's just two smallish studies, but if you use grade criteria and, you know, it gets knocked down from, from the high and you knock it down one, and it, it lands at a moderate and you have, you know, 160 total of two studies and you're saying you have a mo your moderate strength of evidence for, for benefit of this outcome. Um, and it does seem, you know, just intuitively that's where the, the people thing comes in, where you have to think about, does, is that, does that really make sense? I mean, it does on paper if you're, if you're applying that criteria, but there's this fine art of using the data and then using you know, what, you, what you know and what makes sense also. Yeah, I, mean, I find the, the putting strength of evidence into categories both the most time consuming and difficult and the product, the, the aspect of the review that I'm always least satisfied with at the end. And I don't know a good, a good way around it. Any questions for the panel? So I can keep going. I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions I have, and, and it was alluded to by our colleague from uh, Consumers United for Evidence-Based Healthcare, which is, you know, ultimately systematic reviews in themselves are not very user-friendly documents, and I think almost every um, every panelist alluded to that. Um, and so the question is, because we use them to translate into different activities, if there are internal errors with the systematic review, we keep perpetuating it, but they can also um, introduce areas where we know there's uncertainty and areas where there's certainty, and certainly form um, the basis for um, decision making both at an aggregate level, so as a U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is really you know, uh, along communities for primary prevention, but also individual levels when you know, we, we were able to get um, subgroup analyses out of systematic reviews where there's a huge robust um, database. Any thoughts about the future of systematic reviews with um, decision making at both the aggregate level and the individual level? Well, I think um, they, they certainly are needed to inform the decisions, and they, they provide the evidence base and give you, give you some estimates. But I think 
um, unless it's a really simple and clear cut question, it the there needs to probably be some other met other you know whether it's a model or some other way to synthesize the evidence, particularly because it's unusual within a given type of study that all the relevant harms and benefits are are there, and so finding a way to synthesize that product into something that combines that to help make, make a decision is so ultimately needed. I just want to say that the rest of you are really lucky on the panel because Jennifer just said the session is over. <laughs> um, and I didn't realize that and I thought we had like another 20 minutes which is really bad because I am opening up the plenary. So that means I'm way behind time. So my apologies. Um, thank you all and thanks to our panel. We really appreciated your talks.